certainly doesn't take long in scanning the pages of the New Testament to realize that hypocrisy was something that God takes very seriously. Jesus had a real problem with hypocrisy. Clearly in Matthew chapter 23, as was just read from our scripture reading, he spends basically the entire chapter, at least the, uh, the majority of the chapter, really laying into hypocritical practice of religion. The Sermon on the Mount is the same way. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about hypocritical use of prayer and hypocritical practice of fasting and the hypocritical application of charity and to share with other people, but to only do it in a hypocritical manner to be seen by other people. Hypocrisy is certainly not a new problem. It's a very old problem. There's a passage in the book of Jeremiah that I want to start with in Jeremiah chapter 9. The old prophet from Jeremiah chapter 9 said in verses 23 and 24, Let not a, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let, let him who boasts boast of this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. So I suppose when I take a look at myself in the spiritual mirror and I wonder why am I here, why do I do what I do and say what I say, why do I go where I go and, and interact with people the way that I do? What is it that I have to boast in? That I'm a preacher? That, that I'm rich? Or that I'm young? Or that I've done this and accomplished that? What is it that I have to boast of? A career? Degrees? accolades and achievements and awards, a title maybe? What do I have to boast of? Jeremiah challenges us. God, through Jeremiah that is, challenges us. Really take a look at your life and wonder if there's anything truly worth boasting about. And if you're going to boast in anything, can you boast that you know God and that you understand that he's a God who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. Incidentally, it was those same kinds of things that the Pharisees struggled so much in applying in Matthew 23. Loving kindness, to love sinners, to love those who are suffering, to love those who are sick, to love those who are rejected from society, to practice justice and real justice. Things that are right, things that are good, things that are moral. And righteousness, to serve and to live for God in our behavior. And to know that there are good things and there are evil things. And that is a well-defined line in my life. Why does hypocrisy bother us as much as it does? If, in fact, it bother, bothers you at all. Well, I thought of an analogy. This is why hypocrisy bothers me. Hypocrisy bothers me in the same way that if you're going on a field trip in school. You know, there are a lot of reasons that someone might be on a field trip. Now, obviously, the reason they're on a field trip is because they have to be there, right? It's field trip day, and your teacher's going to make you go either way. But I mean the reason is in, like, why do you want to be there? Now, th there are plenty of kids who go on the field trip because... Well, they got a crush on that girl in the other class down the hallway, and they know that on field trip day, they're going to get to be with the other class and maybe see the girl that they like, and maybe that's the day they're finally going to make their move at the pumpkin patch or something like that. Maybe someone is on a field trip because they're just glad to not be in school, because Anything is better than going to school. And listen, they've been to the Pink Palace 12 times already, but even going to the Pink Palace is better than a day sitting in class going to school. So maybe that's why they're at the field trip, because they would just rather be anywhere except in class learning something. There are also those kids that use it as an opportunity to bully the other kids. You know, they're there because they want to, they want to throw things you know, at the bus, 
spit wads, make in front of the teacher behind their back. Like, that's their opportunity. They're outside of class. They're outside the bounds. There's not a lot of adult supervision, and that's kind of their chance to get into mischief. And then there's the kid who actually wants to be there. They actually want to learn something that day. They're excited to be out on the field trip. They want to be there. This is an opportunity. They're excited to be there. And everybody else kind of ruin, ruins it for them. You know, when you actually, like, want to be worshiping God, hypocrisy really bothers you. When you actually want to preach the gospel and you love the gospel and you want to share it with other people, and the reason why you hit a brick wall with someone is because they say, well, yeah, the church is just full of hypocrites. You go, that old argument again. I'll tell you what, as someone who loves to preach the gospel to other people, I can't tell you how many times that argument has come up. Hypocrisy bothers us because when you actually care about the kingdom and you want to do stuff for the kingdom and you really love God and you really love to worship God and you enjoy Bible classes and the Bible is the coolest book that's ever been written and the hypocrites are kind of ruining it for you. The hypocrites make it really, really hard for you when you actually want to be here. Now there are two sides to this. Either... Either I'm bothered by the hypocrites, the way that Jesus was bothered by the hypocrites in Matthew chapter 23, or I'm in very great danger of becoming one of the hypocrites. And it is certainly possible that my own bitterness about hypocrisy might be the thing that bites me and turns me into the very hypocrite that I despise so very much. Do I become one of those same people who says, well, the church is just full of hypocrites, and so I end up not going to church anymore? Do I become the very thing that I had such a problem with all that time? There's one passage in particular that helps us address this. It's, it's, it's a comfort to me, and I hope that it will be a comfort to you. And this is our, our main passage for the day. And we're, we're not going to look at it like in, in extensive detail and look at the language behind it and give a bunch of Greek definitions. But this is the heart of the lesson right here, okay? This is the heart of what I want us to walk away from knowing and really embracing today. From 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. Paul reminds his readers in this very beautiful little passage. Nevertheless, and, and by the way, if you look at the context, because context is important here, isn't it? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, what has he just gotten done talking about just a couple verses earlier? Maybe we ought to read this because this is why he says what he says in verse 19. If you go back a little bit there in verse 14, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth, but avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk, he says in verse 17, will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. He's going to talk about some hypocrites here. Hymenaeus and Philetus, and he mentioned Alexander back in 1 Timothy, and he talks about Alexander again a little bit later in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. But these characters here in Ephesus, these are real hypocrites. They really hurt Paul. In fact, of Alexander later on in chapter 4, he says, remember Alexander the coppersmith? He did me much harm. He's no innocent figure. Alexander did a lot of harm to me. And he says of these people in verse 18, men who have gone astray from the truth saying that the resurrection has already taken place and thus they upset the faith of some. And this is why he says verse 19. Because when you've got Hymenaeuses in the world and you've got Alexanders in your life and the Philetuses of the world, when you've got these characters in your life, making it really, really hard to be the genuine Christian that you want to be, that you're striving to be, when you got people like this making it hard for you, Paul says, remember this. Take comfort in this. Remember, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And... 
Let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. The Lord knows those who are his. Now, hypo- hypocrisy can fool everybody else. Right? Hi- hypocrites can, you, you can trick everybody else out there. You can put on the show and, and you can have the appearance and wear the tie. And, and just like the word hypocrite literally means in Greek, so I told you I wasn't going to do it, but it is one of my favorite Greek words. Hypocrites literally means an actor with two faces. That's what actors were. In Greek and Roman theater, they wore these masks. And the masks even had devices built into them that would alter the sound of their voice. And so a hypocrite is literally a mask-wearing actor. And you can fool everybody else. But Paul says, remember, and take some comfort in this, the Lord knows those who are his. He's not fooled. Though everybody else might be, the Lord is not fooled. The Lord knows those who are saved. And there's not, on the judgment day, on the judgment day, there's not going to be anybody kind of like slipping in with the crowd or something like that. And there's not going to be anybody forgotten also. No paperwork is going to get lost on the judgment day. No one's going to slip between the cracks. The Lord knows those who are his. There's three other passages, I think, that also show this, you know, what bothers us so much about hypocrisy and what bothers God so much about hypocrisy as well. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 14, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, that sin gives opportunities for our enemies to blaspheme, not us, but God. When we don't live the way that we should be living, when we wear the name Christian, but we don't act like it out in the world, it gives everybody in the world the excuse to say, and that's why I'm not a Christian, because of you, because of your behavior, because I heard you were a Christian, but I know the way that you talk around your coworkers. I know the way you talk here at work. Oh, you say you're a Christian, but I hear the way you speak about your coworker. Yeah. Oh, you, you claim to be a Christian, but I know what you've done behind, behind the office. I know what you've done in secret. I know what you've done. When you're not living the life in the real world, but you wear the name of Christ, it gives the enemy a chance to blaspheme, not you, but to blaspheme the name of our God. Romans chapter 2, verse 24, similarly says, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And again, this is in the context in Romans 2 of, speaking of hypocrisy, people who will proclaim the law, but they don't practice it. They'll tell other people not to sin, but they're living in sin themselves. And so they blaspheme the name of God because of you. And again, similarly, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 14, that we ought to give the enemy no occasion for reproach. In all of the struggles of life, we need to be comforted by the fact that there is vindication always at the end of the road, that the Lord knows those who are his. And he knows better than anybody else what it is like to feel the sting and the pain of a hypocrite's bite. You think we get hurt by hypocrites? Imagine being, imagine being God. Imagine placing your name upon the people of Israel and then for however many hundreds of years seeing the way they drag your name through the mud. Imagine what it is like to be God. Now, if hypocrisy bothers me, and let's get real about this. This is the practical side of this. If if hypocrisy bothers me, if if hypocrisy bothers you as much as it bothers me, and I certainly hope that it does, well, I need to learn to be careful not to overstate things. And here's what I mean by this. Like I already alluded to, some have mistakenly, I think, abandoned their faith because of this... (sighs) Maybe lie is not the right word for this. Probably wasn't the right word to pick for the PowerPoint slide, but maybe overstatement is probably a better word, an exaggeration. Because we fall for this kind of overstatement, the church is full of hypocrites, 
And so what we do is we abandon our faith. I think that's a big mistake, and it is an overstatement. I get that one hypocrite really can hurt the work of a church. Like Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump of dough, and that's a bad thing. But are we really serious that the church is full of hypocrites? When you make that statement, I get you make that statement from a place of pain, it's from a place of disappointment, and that's real, and I understand that. But when we make that statement that the church is full of hypocrites, do we really understand what we're saying there? Do we really mean that? Do you really take that literally? You're honestly telling me that every person in this room is just a hypocrite. That out of 200 plus people in a room on a Sunday morning when they could have been doing anything else in the world right now, you are saying that every single person in this room is a hypocrite. I find that hard to believe. Now, is there a hypocrite or two amongst us? Maybe. I guess I wouldn't be surprised if there was. But are you really going to abandon your faith because of the assertion that the church is full of hypocrites. You know what's interesting? I get that religion, obnoxious finger quotes, religion can be a haven for hypocrisy, but the church is not. People who read the Bible a lot are going to find a lot of very convicting things. Like, you, you can't sit here and read the Bible and be like, <laughs> this is exactly the book I need right now to find self-assurance and self-righteousness. Like, really? <laughs> like, you, you went to the Bible for self-assurance and self-righteousness? A lot of sin talked about in the Bible. Coming here and listening to sermons every single Sunday about an innocent man who died a horrible death on a cross because of me and because of you and because of our sins? You mean like that, that is like the perfect environment for hypocrisy to thrive? Is for us to partake of a, of a symbol every single Sunday that reminds us a man was murdered because of us? Like you're telling me that is the appropriate environment for hypocrisy to thrive? I don't know. I guess I just don't buy it that the church is full of hypocrites because I've known too many people in the church. And maybe that's our problem. When we make that overstatement, when we say the church is full of hypocrites, maybe we just don't know quite enough people. Because I get it, and I mean it. I know the pain is real. When a hypocrite hurts you, that's real pain. Try to get to know the people who aren't the hypocrites then and see the other side of that equation. I need to focus on my own actions and not try to decipher other people's motives. I need to not look at someone else's life and say, I bet he's a fake. Nobody smiles as, Gary Taylor, nobody's really in that good of a mood all the time. No, no, I, I don't buy it. No. No, listen. We can't waste our time trying to decide what other people's motives are. Trying to read the tea leaves and, and, and look through the smile, look past the smile, look past, past the words, look past the prayers, look past the persona. That's not our job to make those determinations. Now, we are supposed to judge sin. And when someone sins, we, we do have the ability and the right and the responsibility to call out sin when we see sin. But we have to leave the judgment of motives up to God. A couple of passages here that I think illustrate this very point. If you go to Jeremiah chapter 17, maybe you still had a bookmarker there or something from when we read from chapter 9. But in Jeremiah chapter 17, it says in verses 9 and 10, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Only God is qualified to make that statement. Book of Proverbs very similarly brings up in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 21. In Proverbs 21 and verse 2. Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but it is the Lord who weighs the hearts. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about the word of God being living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. Able to judge the thoughts and intentions of of the man's heart. 
That is what we need to keep in mind. And only God is able to look past the facade that someone has built around their soul. Now that's part one of the lesson. Here's part two, because this is really the more important part. I think it's, it's easier, right? The, the first part of the lesson is the easy part because we can sit here and read Matthew 23 and we can, we can really lay into the hypocrites, right? Hypocrites this and hypocrites that, and I sure do hate the hypocrite, which I don't hate hypocrites. I just hate hypocrisy. Let's be clear about that. That's actually the easy part of the lesson is to call out hypocrisy in someone else's life. You know the hard part, though, and really the more important part of the lesson is to bring it on home and make sure that I'm not becoming the hypocrite. In fact, I'd be a little bit worried about myself. If all I ever did was call out hypocrisy, maybe that would be like the perfect veil to cover up my own hypocrisy. If I just get up here and say it enough times, maybe none of you will know how hypocritical I've been as a Christian. And so I need to learn to confront my own hypocrisy. And hypocrisy comes in a lot of different flavors, too. Let me tell you about some of the hypocrites that, that we see. Let me tell you about some of the hypocrisy that I show from my own life. Snobbishness, that's the first one. That, that's a flavor of hypocrisy, okay? That, 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 that's gilded hypocrisy, okay? When, when you're a snob, that's gilded hypocrisy. That's a upper, upper level gold star member hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy with a little beluga caviar on it. Both secular and religious circles contain plenty of people who think that they're better and more important than other people. And this condition isn't just limited to just the difference between rich and poor or smart or not smart, but it exists in the soul of any person who views someone else with contempt. Just like Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 18, verse 9, where Jesus talks about a parable where there's the Pharisee praying in the temple and the tax collector some distance away praying. Well, the whole parable, which is a great parable, by the way, a sermon on its own, is introduced in the statement in Luke 18, verse 9, where it says, And he also told this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, but viewed others with contempt. Do we really take the lesson of that parable to heart? The snobby Pharisee standing on a pedestal, parading around his own glory versus the tax collector who can't even lift his eyes up to heaven, but instead prays in the deepest humility, in, in, in an aching voice, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Which of the two of those men went to his house, as Jesus says, justified? Perhaps we're bothered by such arrogance because we're secretly envious of the glory or the recognition that they get. Because the snob is someone who is obviously better than us in some ways. The snob is obviously richer than me. Obviously has a nicer car than me. Obviously wears more expensive clothes than me. These are things that are undeniable. I know what my house is worth, and I know that there are houses in the neighborhood down the road that are worth more than mine. I know that. I know what my car is worth, and I know there are cars worth more than that. And so snobbishness is not a rich person problem exclusively. Snobbishness might be a me problem also, because I'm envious of it. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, Paul reminds us in Romans 12 verse 3, For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Now, that doesn't mean think you're a walking piece of trash either, because sometimes we think that's the solution to it, is the answer to my snobbishness is to go ahead and like denigrate myself and, and, and speak of myself as just garbage and just trash and I'm completely worthless. Like, that's also not true, okay? You're worth something. The blood of Jesus because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And who's included in that? 
If God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and I'm here in the world, what does that mean? Well, it means that I was valuable enough to God for the blood of his son on the cross. What about showboaters? That's, that's another flavor of hypocrisy, isn't it? The showboater. you got to show off. Uh, the world has probably always been plagued by plenty of religious showmen out there. Or those who practice religion only for personal profit or recognition. Let me tell you some, some early warning signs that you may be on the way to becoming a showboater. Just a, a few things, a few practical things. Like you, you might be a showboater if you're only signing up to do public service for the church, but you neglect the dirty jobs that have to happen behind the scenes. You'll only do something for East Shelby if it's something where your name is going to be out in public and people know what you've done and you're going to get some credit for it. Maybe you've become a showboater if you just like to incidentally, oh, just, you know, just happen to mention your own religious accomplishments, such as how much you contribute. Oops, did I accidentally tell them how much was on my check this Sunday? Didn't mean to give that away. Or how many people you've baptized ever, or how many, how many generations your family goes back in the church. Well, I'm a third generation. Well, I'm a fourth generation. Well, I'm a fifth generation Christian. You're becoming a showboater if you avoid people who intimidate you. You know what showboaters really hate? People who are better than them. And, if, and here's the thing. If, if you only surround yourself with people who are impressed by you, but you avoid people who maybe call you out for it, or you avoid people who are more talented than you, or you avoid people who intimidate you, that's probably a sign that you're just in it for the showmanship. Maybe you're exaggerating your religious experiences, both to believers and unbelievers. You exaggerate how often you pray or what your church attendance is like, which, by the way, if anybody was in my class a couple weeks ago, I really, man, I really had to eat crow on that one. I was making a joke about how my attendance is perfect attendance. I, you look at the, hey, look at the numbers. Numbers don't lie. Data doesn't lie. There's someone with, with the number one best attendance at East Shelby Church of Christ, and it's Ryan Goodwin. And I was saying that jokingly, of course. And then I had to go and get COVID <laughs> and miss a Sunday. So serves me right, doesn't it? Serves me right for being a showboater. But maybe you're just showing off a little bit more or exaggerating what your religious experiences are. Or you only like to attach yourself to influential, popular, or attractive members of the church only. To the social and spiritual exclusion of those who you deem inferior and not worth your time. So you've made the same mistake as those folks in James chapter 2 who showed their faith in Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Well, remember, Jesus offers a few exhortations on the matter of showboating in religion. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. When, therefore, you give alms, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. And like we already read from Matthew 23, verse 5 in our scripture reading, they do all of their deeds just to be noticed by men. Another flavor of hypocrisy is the know-it-all. The know-it-all. Proverbs 26, verse 12. Proverbs 26, verse 12. Do you see a man who's wise in his own eyes? Well, there's more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs 26 and verse 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can give a discreet answer. Having a relationship with God has nothing to do with outsmarting everybody else around you. It's not about IQ level or mental aptitude. Rather, being close to God has everything to do with considering his words and responding to them. Faith comes from hearing the word in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. You notice he doesn't say knowing everything about the word. No, faith comes from hearing the word, internalizing it, understanding it, 
applying it, living it, doing it. The know-it-all, on the other hand, measures his faithfulness by those he has beaten in verbal assault, or how much Greek he can speak, or how many books he has in his library, or on what kinds of experts and scholars and authorities he can depend. The know-it-all is not interested in anybody else's perspective or experiences or insight, but simply on convincing them that his insight is the only one worth hearing. Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you'll find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. And so I set watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. Maybe a lot of it just boils down to you're too smart for your own good. What kind of hypocrite am I? I'll tell you what, I think I've been guilty of all three of these at some point or multiple points in my life. And I guess I can only speak from personal experience when I make that statement. But what kind of hypocrite are you tempted to be? Which brings us back to our main point, that the Lord knows those who are His. The Lord knows if you're on his side or not. The Lord knows why you're here and what's really going on. The Lord knows what your motives are. And in the end, like 2 Corinthians chapter 5 points out, we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each of us may be recompensed for our deeds in the body according to what we have done, whether good or bad. Judgment is inevitable. And judgment will be merciless to those who have failed to show mercy. Like James chapter 2 points out. The Lord knows those who are His. And I strive to be one of His people. Imperfect as I am, fail as often as I might, I strive to be one of His people. And to be known by Him do you join me in that striving? Maybe you're not a Christian here today. Maybe you are and you've not been living right. God knows where you are right now. He knows exactly where you are. God knows your excuses that you've offered. God knows the things you've told yourself in the middle of the night to make yourself feel better, to convince yourself that everything is okay and that you don't need to change. God knows. But God also knows the aching that you have for reconciliation. God knows the guilt that you feel because you've not been living right. The guilt that maybe you've, you've stuffed it down and covered it up with distractions and put a fresh coat of paint on it to make yourself feel a little bit better. God knows. And God also knows exactly what you need to do to be right with Him. He alone has the prescription for the sickness that the world cannot cure, that wealth cannot cure, that showmanship and accomplishments and accolades cannot cure. He alone knows the cure. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. <laughs> Repent and let each of you be baptized for the remission of your sins. Give yourself fully over to God in faith and obedience and to make your life his so that he can live through you. And God will know that. He'll know that you're a vessel for his honor and his glory. And he knows that your name is written in the book of life. Do you want that? Well, then don't delay any longer. If you have any spiritual need at all, then please let that need be known by coming forward as we stand and sing.